Okay, the three revelations. This is something that is in the basic uh, books of Spiritism. It's in, actually in two books, in two places, but that's not the only place it is. Uh, other books following the five initial books of Spiritism will touch on that, uh, some of them deeply. And what we want to do is compile a lot of information. Obviously, there's a lot of history here. We, we, we're not going to go through history because it's not a history class. But it would be nice if we could devote more time to this. So the idea is uh, understand what these three revelations are and how one takes, leads to another and leads to the third, how they are interconnected. And best of all, we are here in 2016. What, what do they do for me? Or how do they fit my life? So that's the goal of tonight's study. And Alan Kardec's going to tell us that uh, the three revelations are a sequence, are based on a sequence of history events. The first of all, the first of, of them is when Moses comes down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. So that is the first revelation. Uh, you see, when he comes down the mountain, we're talking here about 1300 BC. The people living in those days, the knowledge, the culture was completely different than ours. So when he brings that in, he needs to not only deliver the message, but he has to do something so that people understand. Just think of this. Uh, every time before this, before this, every time I'm arguing with somebody and it gets a little difficult, it gets heated, it's just easier to get the sword and run through his body and we're all done. Let's go to the next life or to the next discussion or let's go ahead. It's, it's a fact of life in those days before the tablets come down from the mountain. So when he presents that don't kill, it's a little, how come? It, it's, it, uh, Moses is going to face that question. How come if I do this all the time? It's something in our daily lives. So he's going to have to do, using modern terms, he's going to have to be like a dictator. He's going to impose this on us, and he's going to have to make it happen, and we're going to see that in a little bit. With the second uh, <coughs> revelation, when Jesus comes, and that's about 12 to 1300 years later, when Jesus comes, uh, he's going to present the same laws, the same Ten Commandments, the same laws in a different way, with a different view and a different angle. He will not impose anything on anybody. He will not threaten anybody. He will not speak uh, uh, harsh to anybody. He's the great counselor. He's going to counsel us. He's going to tell us, I wouldn't do this, I would do that. Don't do this, do that. He's the great counselor. And then in 1857, the Spirit's book uh, started, starts Spiritism, and it's going to give us a whole different perspective. So there's, th there's a difference in all these things. We need to understand what each one is doing here, how they lead to another. Okay? So we know where we are here. We are in 2016, but some of us didn't get to Moses yet. If you think about it, we're still killing. So it's, it's 4,000 years ago, and we still have made it to 1857. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's start uh, thinking about this. When the first, the first religion in place that we know of starts in more or less about 8,000 before Christ. So that's about 10,000 years ago. And that's similar to the Indians, you know, the, the natives. Uh, in those days, we, we didn't have the concern of spirit and matter. It was all one thing. We don't have a body and a soul. It was just one thing. And they would look at the skies and say, oh, we got a lot of gods. A lot of things happen. So there's a god for the sun, a god for the seas, a god for the moon. So they had all these different gods. When Abraham comes, and that's in about 1800 BC, he's going to present us with a different view. And the view is all those things, the sea, the sun, and the moon, and so and so and so, they are different expressions of the same one God above everything else. So that starts monotheism. Now, it's, uh, if we're going to start a new belief system, if he's going to bring us a new belief system, he has to start somewhere on the planet and with some people. And that's the question. Why those people, right? 
So to answer this, Spirit Emmanuel writes about it and he tells us that there are some things that made it favorable for the Hebrews to be the ones receiving the message. First of all, when they get the Ten Commandments from Moses, they were already living about six or seven hundred years under the idea of monotheism by Abraham. So it was easy to accept Moses coming down. This came from the one God. It was a lot easier than other people because they were already living under monotheism. So that's a, an aspect that makes it favorable and easy for them to comprehend. There's no shock. So transitioning from Abraham to Moses was relatively easy. Receiving the Ten Commandments was relatively easy in that aspect. And they were already, and they're still out to this day, very favor, uh, fervent followers of God. They still are. Hebrews and Jews, they still are. Which also, again, made it very made a better transition, an easier transition from Abraham to uh, Moses. But there are some things that weren't that very easy for them. One of them is what Emmanuel called the spiritual deficit. So they were living uh, a life based completely on material goods and you know acquisitions and stuff like that. Very materialistic at that time. So they had a tremendous spiritual deficit. So that entitles them to be the ones receiving that message because they need it. They are not doing what, they're, you know, what they were supposed to be doing. And an, a second thing that Emmanuel brings us is the idea of the proud vanity. And that's something he goes at length, uh, Emmanuel, Spirit Emmanuel, in the book On the Way of the Light, and On the Way to the Light. And this proud vanity is the idea that the Jews were proud because they were simply Jews. And it gets so heavy that Emmanuel puts this phrase on the book. He's telling us about the idea that the Jews were waiting for a Messiah. So he's describing that in the text, and this is what it says. The Lord, which is this Messiah that is expected, would arrive in a magnificent chariot in his divine glory. Look at this thing. Look at the size of this thing. Escorted from heaven by earth by a legion of its thrones and angels. So it's something like absolutely out of this world. He would humiliate all the kings of the world. He would humiliate all the kings of the world and come from Israel, the supreme scepter to guide all the people of the planet. So they were expecting that kind of thing. He would perform all sorts of miracles eclipsing the glory of the Caesars. A Caesar in these days is, is a semi-god. It's, it's almost a God on earth. So you, you see the perspective that what they are expecting. And that's what, that, that kind of thought, that kind of uh, energy that they bring in their minds is what Emmanuel calls the proud vanity. And because of this, they were the ones that were entitled to receive the messages or the message that Moses brought to us. So Moses comes down the mountain, brings the message. Uh, and the question is, why him? It could be any other Jew, any other Hebrew. And we know from history, we're not going to get into history because it's not the point, but we know that he was uh, a born Hebrew, but he was not raised among them. He was raised in a palace with the Egyptians. He was, he was very well educated. He was a warrior. Also, he had the knowledge, great knowledge of strategy. He was an architect. He was a million things. He was prepared to have this thing under on his shoulders. He was really prepared for that. It, wasn't, it couldn't be anybody. It, it had to be somebody that had, per se, a foot in the Egyptian palace because he was going to take his people out of Egypt. It would, it would be a lot easier if he had access to the palace. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of things that will just make it easier for him to be the one, quote, chosen to take this revelation and deliver to us. So that's the first revelation. He comes down the mountain and presents the 10 revelations. So we're going to pick one here. Let's say don't kill, number five. Now, again, don't kill. But people are going to say, but how come if I could kill freely until five minutes ago? I just killed people this morning. How come right now, as of this moment, I can't? It's very hard for these people to comprehend, very difficult, because they are not uh, their cultural level, their uh, knowledge, their spiritual level is not in line with this. So they revolt. They revolt. Revolting means I'm not going to do any of this. 
that's what it is. I'm, I'm just going to do the other way around. I'm going to do the opposite because I don't buy this thing. So Moses had to, like, take an attitude. He had to take these Ten Commandments and append to these commandments a set of laws that we call, today we call mosaic laws, or some people call disciplinary laws. And the purpose of these laws were to address and sustain the Ten Commandments. So for example, don't kill, that's a commandment. Now, if you keep killing, we're going to do uh, uh, something like this, don't kill, but if you kill, you go to jail. You see, if you kill, you go to jail is not part of the divine law. The law is don't kill. So he had to make adjustments one by one to sustain the idea of don't kill. So if you kill, you're going to get to jail. You're gonna, something's going to happen to you. There's going to be consequences at the material, physical le level. So these laws today are known as uh, mosaic laws. And they are the ones trying to get, these laws are the ones trying to get these people out of revolt and incomprehension. So Moses had to create a set of 613 laws that go along with those 10. So when the Hebrews, 613. So when the Jews look at that, for them, in those days, it is a set of 623 divine laws. This is what they see. It isn't, but this is what they see in these days. So they're not really sure or it's not really clear what is a mosaic law which is mo nothing like more like a social law for the society itself and the divine law for them it's all divine so now we have this 630 and 23 laws and for the jews this is divine law okay what's the difference between a divine law and a disciplinary law Here's some ideas. A divine law does not recognize time and space. For example, don't kill. It was valid in Palestine territory, whatever the name was at the time, Judea. 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, it's still valid today. It's valid in Orlando, Florida today. Different place, different time. So it crosses time and space. It does not recognize time and space. It's something we could say, in quotes, eternal. Now, this cannot be modified. What we modify is the social law that goes with that. So for example, don't kill. If you kill, you go to jail. If we think it's too heavy, we'll change it. If you kill, you, you're going to spend time, I don't know, on the corner. We change that, but we don't change the don't kill because that's the divine law. So what we change is the disciplinary law. The divine law can't be changed. It can't be adjusted to interest. It's don't kill is don't kill, OK? It cannot be adjusted for conveniences. For example, uh, in Brazil, there was a, a, a tremendous discussion in 1951 when the law was don't kill. The social law was don't kill. If you kill, you go, you go to jail. But one of the high qualified men in the country, high top politician, he assassinated two people within a parliament or within the, you know, the Congress. And then he's, he's supposed to fall under the law. So don't kill if you kill, you go to jail. But he, because of his influence, he was able to adjust the law himself. And the law became, don't kill if you kill, you're going to go to jail. But your first crime, we're kind of not going to look into that. And you see, we keep adjusting. That's, being that's subject to time and space. It changed because of a place. It changed because of a different time. But the divine law, don't kill, is always there. We can't change those. On the other hand, disciplinary laws can be adjusted. They are subject to space and time. For example, uh, if you commit, let's say, adultery in the Middle East, the, the penalty is not the same as in here. It's a different penalty. It's a different place. Okay, So th th that's a disciplinary law. It's not divine law. So Moses brings this uh, uh, to us, and he presents his Ten Commandments and his disciplinary law. And this goes in place. Now, how, and he dies, of course. One day he dies. How is that maintained? How is that sustained? It, it was sustained because it's still in place. The Jews are here. It's still in place. Don't kill is still valid for us. So it was sustained in principle by the combination of divine laws and disciplinary laws. 
And the Jews, they lived by that until the year more or less 63 before Christ, before Jesus, when the Roman Empire takes over what today is the Greece, uh, uh, Greece and to, in Judea. So the Roman Empire by the year 63 BC takes over those places and it starts to impose their own settings, their own laws, their own ideas on top of these, all these people, the Jews being one of them. So the Jews are living by their laws and then the Romans come with their laws on top so these have priority now over the Jews' laws. And the Jew will say, I'm not going to follow that because it doesn't apply to me. My law is not the Roman law. So because of the cultural you know, differences, they have to all the time be clashing with the Romans because they do not accept the law or the, you know, wh whatever the, they're being told by the Romans. You've got to do sacrifices. You've got you know, you to love the Pharaoh uh, or something like that. It isn't like this. So what happens is that for the Jews, the new law is incompatible with the divine law. Again, what is the divine law for these people? 623 laws, okay? So they look at their laws and they say, this is not compatible with what I see, what I get from the Romans. And they revolt. They revolt and there's going to be trouble. So you see, things are changing in their mind. It, things are getting more difficult. They are trying to adjust still to the Mosaic law where don't kill wasn't necessarily true and now it is. Now they're trying to adjust to the Roman Empire and then come Jesus and says it's nothing like this and it's going to get even more complicated. Under the Roman domination, one of the things that really got into the Jews is the idea of the tax collectors. And the reason why that is is it's not because they had to pay taxes. It's because they don't see anything being done with that money for them. It doesn't come back to them. It just goes to Rome and stays in there and disappears. So for them, this is very, very, very serious. And they revolt because of that. Okay, then we go into a second revelation when Jesus comes in and says, it's nothing like this. It's nothing like what you're trying to learn. It's different. So Jesus is going to say, what you know is a certain God, but that's not exactly what it is. He's going to tell us about the laws of love, that somebody, you know, is aggressive to you. The, the, the thing that you're not going to be is a, be aggressive back to them, which is completely different than what Moses is bringing or these people are understanding, an eye for an eye. It's different. Jesus is going to bring us a God that's not punishing anybody. He's merciful, he's good, he's forgiven. He's not here to punish anyone. He's here to help us be better. And the idea that Jesus brings that the need to forgive and practice charity in order to be forgiven. This is for the Jews. It, it just won't get in their minds in those days. Which is like this. You want to be forgiven? Forgive. For them it's you won't get into their minds because of the state of things, the level of evolution, the cultural uh, turbulence between them and the Romans. They won't just get it. It's very hard for them. And then Jesus talks about a real kingdom. And the real kingdom is not of this world, but a celestial kingdom. And then it gets even more complicated because, you, you know, how, how come? How come? Celestial means there's no punishment. There's nothing bad. There's no one on top of you. There's no one saying no, 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 don't, can't, won't do, won't be. There's nothing like this. And, and it's very difficult for the Jews to understand this. To the point where Jesus is confronted and he has to come up with the famous phrase, I have not come to destroy the law. And this is the phrase. We're going to go through this a little bit uh, in details. But this is the whole phrase. So why is he saying I do not have come to destroy the law? Because he's been told that you came to destroy my law, destroy my law. That's what he's being told. He had to reply with this. So let's analyze exactly what he said to, to understand what was really told by Jesus to these people. Now, first, who is saying that? Who is Jesus who is saying this? If you go back in time, we know that the planet has been around for four and a half billion years. We have life on the planet for three and a half billion years. By then, when the planet starts, there's, a, there's somebody coordinating all of that. There's a spiritual governor 
for the planet, which is who is Jesus, which is Jesus. So Jesus is at least a pure spirit, three and a half billion years before us. At least, to say the least. Of course, the Jews don't know that, but that's the person, for them, Jesus is just a person. That's the person who is telling us that. That's the high spirit, the high caliber spirit that's telling us all of this, that's telling you, that's telling us, I have not come to destroy the law. And so he is the spiritual governor of the planet, but not only that, he is part of the angelical communities. It's like, for example, here in the United States, we have 50 states, there's a governor for each state, there's a governor for Florida, for California, for New York, and supposedly the governor takes care of his state only. The governor of Florida is not gonna do anything in California. But let's say, for example, that President Obama calls all of them, all of the 50, and say, we're gonna do a big meeting, all of us 50. In that meeting, the governor of Florida is slightly above Florida. The governor of California is slightly above because they are now part of a more global thing. And Jesus is part of one uh, these angelical communities. So he's even higher than just being governor of the planet. Through his power, through his help, he sends over prophets and missionaries. But we don't understand them. We do what we did throughout time. We kill these people, we didn't pay attention to them, we forgot who they are. And that's the spirit who is telling us, I have not come to destroy the law. The Jews don't know that, but that's the caliber of the spirit who is telling us this. Let's analyze what he said. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. Okay, the law. What, what is the law again? It's for these people. When he says that, okay, the law means, oh, he's talking about those 623 divine laws. That's what they're thinking. And if you touch one of them, you're touching the law of God. But you see, that's not what it is. The law. Law is something human. We make it up. We made the rules and the penalties. You can't do this. If you do, here's your penalty. You can't do that. If you do, here's your penalty. This is made by us. None of the law uh, that came, the divine law, has penalties. It's simply, you can't do this, or you shouldn't do this, or you don't do this. There are no penalties. Penalties come from us. Penalties are human definitions to our interpretation. Divine law doesn't have any penalties. So the meaning for the law for the Hebrews, when Jesus says that, is the 623. So they understand everything wrong. Meaning, Jesus came to change part of the 613, not any of the 10. Those are unchangeable. But because of the Jews interpret everything being divine, he came to destroy the law. Destroy the law. That's what they think. And that's why you know, people wouldn't understand why he was saying that he didn't come to destroy the law. It's a matter of interpretation. He's talking about one thing, and the J Jews, the Hebrews, are interpreting something different. He did not have, he did not come to destroy or to change the law of God. But he did to adjust the other 613, an eye for an eye, for example. That's not a divine law. It didn't come from God. It came from men. So here's the saying again, let's continue. I have not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. So what, what is fulfill the law? Fulfill the law means, you see, I, I put it here, practice the law is different than fulfill and make others fulfill. I can come in here and tell you, the law says that, do it. That's different than me doing it. I can tell you to do and not do, but that's different. Fulfill the law is for everyone. Jesus himself included. So he came to confirm what was already in place. If you're fulfilling something, that something is already in place. He didn't create anything. He didn't change anything. The law was already in there. He came to fulfill. He came to, to say, okay, I'm also subject to that. And here it is. This is what, what I'm going to live by, and I'm going to teach you how to live by as well. So Jesus presents his new perspective, which is the second revelation, and how does that survive? It did survive because we're here. If we're here discussing him and you know we got three million Christians in the world, it, this thing survived. The first indication that this is gonna survive comes from him. 
himself. When he says, I'm going to send you, later on, I'm going to send you a counselor. And that's going to take care of things, explain better, and then you're going to understand more. So he's telling us this is not going to die here in, in his days. There will be a continuation. And it does continue. It continues through time. We go through a lot of different uh, processes throughout the Middle Ages, most of them bad, unfortunately. Most of them have to do with battles, wars, blood, and all of those things. But yeah, we did. We, we had to go through a million things. Now, two of these things are important for, that will take us into the third revelation is, in 1455, we have uh, Gutenberg with the printed press. From that point on, we don't have to copy manuscripts by hand anymore. We can just print them, and they're all the same. If you go to a bookstore, if you go to Barnes & Noble and you buy a book, would you ever say, I'm buying this book, uh, I want to verify with this same book to see if they're exactly the same. You wouldn't do this today because it doesn't make sense to compare the same book, you know, side by side. But in those days, we didn't know. We were copying by hand. So in 1455, you, it became a lot easier to disseminate information, any type of information. The book that was most printed and still today is the, is the Bible. So it was easy for Christianity to get access to their literature. Uh, Christianity is a bookish religion. And so we have to get the books. We have to read. We have to understand what's being said. And not only that, in, in the late 1800s, a different movement takes place, which is the Industrial Revolution, where we start using our brains more than ever before because we were under heavy dogmas all the time. We couldn't think. We couldn't ask. We were urged not to ask, urged not to think, and simply accept what came from above, and the above is, is the church. In the late 1800s, something, or in the early 1800s, something starts to change. We are now being invited you know, to think, to do different things. And that's what's going to take us into the Industrial Revolution. And part of it has to do with the ability that we then have to read books throughout the planet because we had printed press. So when we get to the mid-1800s where the third revelation comes in place, we were ready for that. But you see, the third revelation couldn't come before. If the third revelation came before <coughs> printed press, it wouldn't do anything for us. It had to be in place when printed press was well, very well established across at least Europe and, and other places. So uh, things had to be in place before this third revelation was presented to us. And the third revelation starts with the Spirit's book. And when you look at the, uh, in those days, the names of the books were paragraphs, not names like today, you know, three, four catchy words. It wasn't like this. The name of the Spirit's book is this whole thing here. The Spirit's book, Principles of the Spiritist Doctrine Concerning the Immortality of the Soul, the Nature of, spirit, of Spirits, and their relationship with humankind, moral laws, and present life, the future life and the destiny of humanity, according to the teachings given by highly evolved spirits through several mediums received and coordinated by Allan Kardec. That's the name of the book. That's a lot. But it also tells you how big this thing is. It will talk about a million things here. We can see the size of what's coming. It is very wide. It's a very, you know, the, the, it touches basically everything. It will in, have a tremendous impact on us. Spiritism didn't die, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So how does it continue? Continuation starts with Alan Kardec himself writing uh, several different books, and that's a whole different uh, lecture but he writes several different books in his 12 years of incarnation after he started the Spirit's book. And then when he dies in 1869, how does this thing continue? He continues with the people who were part of his group, Leon Denis and Camille Flammarion and other people. But then it gets into our days, and it, it's something interesting that we need to consider. We, go, we, we started getting from different people, different sources, mediumistic texts telling us truth and different things and confirming things that we uh, were told before. 
a lot of these things were very challenging. We wouldn't understand. We had to put them aside because it wasn't making any sense to us in the past, and they do now. But it all starts with this, following Allan Kardec's work. And then if you go into the modern day, every day in a quantum physics lab, we find something else. We find a different particle, a different reaction. That's a revelation that, you know, there's something else than just this material things that we know. It's revelation. It's part of our revelation. If you go into our ecology, we destroy our ecology, uh, you know, in certain ways that it comes back to us. We feel it. You, it makes us feel bad in, in, in a way. So it is part of a revelation. You, we never thought that plants were that important. Yes, they are, because we don't breathe if we don't have them. It goes against ourselves. So that kind of revelation, it's, it's in place every day. Here's another one, genetics. We go to a genetic lab today. It's a different discovery every week. And a lot of them we, we cannot even understand because of the technical terms, but there has been a million discoveries on genetics. It, and the thing is not stopping, molecular biology. Every day we discover something new. Every day we, dis we discover from uh, medicine a new treatment. Every day we identify a source of a new disease that now we can do something so it doesn't propagate. So these things are all revelations in a way. See, it doesn't have to be a revelation in, this, in the religious only sense. It can be something totally broad. So when we see these things, you, will, you, will, you should catch our attention. Wow, now we know this. You see the human body itself, the way it works. The, uh, w you go to a biology class in, in high school, which is just very, very, very basic knowledge. It's amazing how the, you know, the veins and the blood and this and the liver, how things are coordinated. That's, that's the kind of revelation that we are talking here. So the revelation didn't stop. And it's part of our routine. Every day, we go into a new emotion. We are presented with something new, with new challenges. New challenges mean, I haven't faced this thing yet. How do I face it? That's a revelation that there's something higher. We couldn't even, we could never thought of that situation until it happens to us. So I was limited on my thought, thinking that this is the worst. No, it can get worse. This is the best. No, it can get better. So in our daily emotions, the things we have to do, the people we have to deal with, the situations we have to address and, and go with, those are revelations for ourselves. And the idea that it is all in our conscience. It is all here. It's all us and ourselves. Don't, don't blame anybody else because it's us. Uh, I did something wrong, I'm going to have to face and deal with that. I did something good, I'm going to get something good coming back to me. So all, all these revelations here, they are in place. It all depends on how we find them. If we turn the news and we're going to see war every time, we're not going to find any revelation. That's not what we're looking for. The revelation is in the good things. No God is going to reveal anything bad. There is no punishment. That's a thing of the past. You already crossed that. So today, who is carrying over these revelations? People like us. People like us here. Because when we go to work, okay, and our colleagues look at us and they keep looking at, oh, this guy's different. He does something different. Oh, that person is different. She, she doesn't get so mad. With time, they'll come to us and say, what do you think? What's your belief system? What do you believe in? And, and why is that? Because they're seeing there's something different. We are different. We are doing something based on a different belief system. When we tell them what this is, it, you know, it raises a f flags for them. They will start asking us questions. You know, people from the uh, different belief systems at work environment, they start asking questions. What do you guys think of this? Then there's bad news uh, on the news the night before. They'll come to us. What do you guys think this? How do you guys analyze this? Because they don't have the answers. You see, uh, a plane, an airplane falls, 300 people die. What's the answer for other belief systems? There is no answer. They'll come to us. What do you think of that? So you see, it's us. It's the way we do. It's, it, we're disseminating by doing it, not by preaching. Preaching is organized religion. It's different. So that's how spiritism survives. 
Now, if we have to analyze this uh, in terms of the three revelations, Every time you change to a belief system, and if you follow the three revelations, we had nothing, then we had Moses, then we had Jesus, then we had Kardec. Every time you change belief systems, you have to change our attitudes. When we come into spiritism from something else, from any other organized religion, from any other belief system, we change. We don't go to the same places anymore. We don't have the same friends anymore. We don't do the same things anymore. We react to different, in different ways differently than what we did in the past, we change. And, thing, and, and people will come to us and say, you changed so much. Yeah, but for good, because I'm doing something different now. I'm doing something better with my life. The change of attitude means I'm changing my belief system. I'm engaging in something that's much more than an eye for an eye. So to explain this to us, it, it would be nice if we could uh, just interview these three people. Can you imagine if we could just have here, sitting here, Moses, Jesus, and Alan Kardec? That would be nice, and just ask questions like that to see what each one is gonna answer. Well, I don't know if we can do that physically, but we can do that by the knowledge that Spiritism gives us. So that's exactly what we do. We're gonna ask questions for these three spirits that came down at different times revealing something to us. So it's a set of eight questions, okay? And here's the first question. Whom are these laws for? They all came to bring us laws, right? So the question is, whom did you bring these laws for? for? <laughs> Moses is gonna say, I brought this for the Hebrews, right? Jesus is gonna say, I brought this for the people on earth. And Alan Kardec is gonna say, I brought this for the entire universe. You see, it's the same question, but look at the answer. Look at the answers. It's totally different. Look at, you go from one uh, small group of people to everything. One question, three different answers. Question number two, how long are these laws valid for? Okay, you brought them to us. How long are they valid for? So Moses is gonna say, well, for your whole life, you're dead, you're dead. They do not apply anymore. Jesus is gonna say, for your whole life, but both corporeal and spiritual. And Kardec is gonna say, they are eternal laws. So look at the difference again. Look at the level of consciousness. You go from, yeah, until the day you die to, there's no end to this thing, they are eternal. Question number three, what ideas do these laws express? That's an interesting question. What are, are they expressing? So Moses is gonna say, well, force and absolutism. Just take this, you know, swallow this. Because I brought it down from the mountain, here they are. Don't ask. Jesus is gonna say, counseling. He's the great counselor. He's gonna, the, the adulterous woman situation. He's not gonna condemn, he's not gonna do anything. He's gonna say, well, look at this. I wouldn't do anything to you, but let me counsel you. Don't do this, do that. Don't do this again. He's a great counselor, this great uh, friend. He's not imposing, there is no force in absolutism, absolutism at all. And Alan Kardec, expensibility and liberation, meaning when I do, uh, when I understand what these laws are expressing, I'm free. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then I'm free. I don't have to be concerned about a judgment day kind of thing. I don't have to be concerned about, oh, people are judging me. This is good, this is bad. I just do the right thing. Ex expensability, you feel like the size of the universe. When you start engulfing spiritism, that's the feeling that comes inside, liberation. When here, there's no liberation, exactly the other way around. Question number four, what do these laws demonstrate? So Moses is gonna say force and fear. God has force and you gotta fear him. Jesus, faith and love. You see, it's the same as a child when he tries to put his finger here on the outlet, you're gonna hit him. So at that moment, you're a monster from his perspective. You don't love me, you wanna kill me, you wanna get my, you know, you wanna break my arm, you wanna break my hands. But that's not what it is, that's love. You don't want him to get hurt. When you need to be at a different level to understand that's not force, that's not fear. It is faith and love. 
And now Allan Kardec is going to say, yes, it's faith and love, but faith with reason and love is unconditional. It's different. Faith with reason means no dogmas, no rituals, nothing like this. Think, ask, stop. Question number five. What is the attitude before these laws? So once they're in place, how, do sh how should I behave? How should I go by? Moses, submission and obedience. You don't ask. You just follow that. That's it. Jesus, action. What is action? For example, don't kill. What is action? Everything that throws me in direction of wanting to kill somebody, I got to do something about it. I got to act. That's action. I need to do something to avoid that. I need to do something to get away from this path and get into that path. Action. Jesus tells us do. First revelation is mostly based on don't, can't, won't. Second revelation is based on do, go, go ahead, do this, do that. And Alan Kardec, what is the attitude before these laws? Action, yes, but with responsibility. Because if there's no responsibility, there will be consequences. And it's not going to be fun. So you, you can see here the difference in, in level of consciousness. It's the same question all across. Question number six, how do I interpret these laws that you three guys brought? Moses, these are the laws of God. I went to the mountain, I was given those. These are the laws of God. Jesus, this is how we practice the laws of God. This is fulfill the law. Here's what it is. The law is here for me also. I'm going to show you how to practice the laws of God. I'm going to walk within you, and I'm going to show you how to practice the law of love. And Alan Kardec, this is how we comprehend the laws of God. So when you say don't kill here, yeah, because God says so. When you say don't kill here, you're going to say, he's going to show us that you don't need to kill practice and here you're going to comprehend that if you kill you're in trouble so better not do it there's a reason for that that there's something greater than what we can see and we need to abide to that question number seven how would you call these laws if we have to give a name for these laws moses love justice that's it jesus love love Alan Kardec, the law of the eternal truth. Different things. Same question. Question number eight. Where are these laws inscribed? Moses, in stone. They're carved in stone. I did it myself. Jesus, in our hearts. Alan Kardec, in our conscience. It's, it's different. It's not something that's written in stone. It's not something that is on paper. You can have as many uh, uh, social laws written on paper as many times as you want. You can sign uh, a treats, uh, treaties of peace all the time. We're still not going to be in peace because it doesn't have anything to do with where this thing is done physically. It is all here. So you, you can see that there are three different levels of consciousness, and it's a great jump from one to another. Now, not all of us necessarily are on the top one. And that's a good exercise. If we can do some sort of uh, auto-analysis or self-evaluation, let me see where I am. So let's put these laws in place here. Okay, so we got a sequence of things. Prior to Moses, then Moses comes down with the first revelation, then prior to Jesus, and so and so and so and so. And I put colors in there. So let's say that I come here and I say, people, I am in favor of the death penalty. If you look at this, where am I here? I'm in the black, right? Literally, I'm in the dark because I haven't comprehended the first revelation yet. Not even that. I'm living 4,000 years ago because I haven't understood the first revelation. So every time somebody says, I'm in favor of the death penalty, you can kind of situate where this person is and how far we should be from this person. <coughs> and here's another one. If I tell you, he will pay for what he did to me, 
He will pay for what he did to me. Where am I here? In these colors, in these four colors. You see, I passed Moses, right? I passed Moses, so I'm no longer in the black. Maybe I'm in the red. I'm in the red because Jesus would never say something like that. He would teach against that. He will pay what he did for, to me. That's exactly what he was here to tell. Don't do this. It's not an eye for an eye anymore. An eye for an eye is here in, in Moses. This is no longer an eye for an eye. So if I say this, I haven't comprehended Jesus yet. I have not understood the second revelation yet. I'm still in the first. I'm living thousands of years ago. And then here's another example. Let's say I'm driving here on the turnpike and somebody keeps on the horn all the time, on and on and on. He wants to pass me. And then I just go say, I, w I wish he crashes his car right ahead. <laughs> it doesn't happen, of course. This is, this is just... It's just an exercise. It's a virtual exercise. Nobody says that. But think about this. When we say that, where am I here? I'm not even on the yellow. Right? I haven't got to the yellow yet because Jesus wouldn't approve that. He wouldn't say that. I'm in the red. So I'm living at least 2,000 years, 2, years ago. I'm out of time. I'm not in my time. I need to do more than this. Here's another one. I can't forgive him. He did something to me. I can't forgive him. Where do you think I am here? Where do you think? No. You see, when I say I can't forgive him, I know I have to. It's just very hard. But I know I have to. So I did learn Jesus. I'm on the yellow. It's a tricky question. I'm on the yellow because I know I have to forgive. I just can't. It's so hard. But I'm trying. So I'm at least on the yellow. I have understood what Jesus is saying. And here's the last one. If I tell you, I'm working on my moral transformation. I, I, I want to be different. <coughs> I'm on the green. Because I know there's a reason for that. And I know that reason. And the explanation only comes on the third revelation. You see, the first revelation, it's some sort of imposition. The second revelation is counseling. The third revelation is explanation. So that's, the, that's why they are so different. And for those same eight questions, the answers are completely different because we're looking into three different levels of consciousness. Now, as we go along climbing that line, awareness grows and moral progress grows. So the more I approach the green here, it's because more awareness I have and more moral progress I'm, in, I'm acquiring, I'm gaining. To the point that I'm going to be so high that I don't need to come back and reincarnate. I need to be doing this to a certain level. When I'm pure spirit, I don't have to come back anymore. Now, there's one thing. Nobody said that this is only for us incarnates. All of these things apply to discarnates as well. So it doesn't matter if we're here or on the other side. The laws are eternal. The laws are for every single spirit. They are universal. They are good for all spirits on earth and other places. They are universal. So when we go back to the idea of three revelations, I think we need to go and analyze attitudes on our day by day. For example, I go to a meeting with a boss and I didn't like it. Where am I? Where am I? Did I understand Moses? Did I understand Jesus? Did I understand Kardec? Where am I? Because if all the time I'm on the dark, I'm on the bread, I better do something fast. If I'm on the yellows and green, that's better, especially greens. But if I don't do anything, I'm going to be suffering. I'm going to just create more suffering for my future. Because if I'm suffering now, my future is made of what I do now. If what I do now is suffer because I'm not understanding what's happening, I'm going to suffer in the future. So when we go back and analyze where we are in, in regards to the three revelations, we're going to catch ourselves 
very fast and it's not going to be fun. In the beginning, it's very complicated because we go like, wow, I'm living thousands of years ago. But that's how we start. That's the start of bringing us in line with time. Okay, thank you very much. You all have a good night.